Welcome back to Economic Outlook. Over the past few weeks, we've spent a lot of time discussing bank failures, government bailouts, and the ongoing financial crisis in America. Today we're going to look at one specific step taken by the Treasury Department to try to encourage bank mergers and acquisitions. While the government was debating the $700 billion bailout package for Wall Street, the Treasury Department discreetly issued a notice changing the status of Section 382 of the Internal Revenue Code. Now, this notice didn't get a lot of attention from the media or from legislators who were debating the bailout. However, it has drastic implications for tax revenue and dramatically changed the structure of bank mergers and acquisitions. Today we're going to look at exactly what the Treasury Department did, examine if it had the authority to act and issue the notice, and finally, we'll look at the practical implications for the change in Section 382's application and look at why Congress is so angry at the Treasury Department for making the ruling that it did. Understanding what the Treasury Department did when it issued Notice 2008-100 requires some understanding of corporate taxation. So what I'm going to do is go through a few simplified examples to show how corporations are taxed today and explain the implications for modifying Section 382. When companies lose money in a fiscal year, they're able to carry their losses forward to offset gains in income in future years. This reduces their tax burden in years when they're profitable by reducing their income by the amount they lost in previous years. Let's look at an example to make sure this is clear for everyone. Here we can see a company which lost $1 million in 2007. They paid no taxes that year because they had negative income. Now in 2008, the company had $4 million in taxable income. If they were taxed at the normal rate of 35%, this means they would pay $1.4 million in taxes. However, in 2008, the company gets to adjust its income and subtract the amount of money they lost in 2007. This reduces their taxable income from $4 million to $3 million and they're only taxed $1,050,000. This amounts to a $350,000 savings. So, when companies have losses, they're able to, duck, to deduct them from earnings in future years. This means that they're able to save taxes at the rate of the amount lost times the applicable tax rate, usually 35% for large corporations. When companies have losses over a period of years, these losses accumulate. As companies begin to fail, it becomes less and less likely that they'll ever be able to use these losses to offset positive income in future years. Therefore, what would be an attractive option for a company in this situation that's going to fail? Well, ideally, they would like to sell themselves to another company which can use the losses of the target company to offset positive income in the acquiring company. For example, Think of a company with $10 million of accumulated losses, which is going to go out of business soon. They won't be able to use these $10 million in losses to offset their own income, so they might want to sell themselves to another company. If another company took these $10 million in losses and offset their positive income, they would save $3.5 million in taxes, or $10 million times the 35% tax rate. Ideally, the company with the losses would try to sell itself for some value less than $3.5 million to the company, which will then use the losses to offset its positive income. While this sounds like a good plan in theory, the U.S. tax code disallows it. When a company acquires another, it is not allowed to use the acquired company's accumulated losses to offset income. Now, there are a few complicated exceptions to this. But to simplify things, we'll assume that a company can't acquire another and use losses against net income. These are called Section 382 limitations, and they apply to all companies which acquire companies with losses. Section 382 was created to prevent fraudulent tax shelters and avoid the trafficking of losses through mergers and acquisitions. Section 382 says that the acquiring company must multiply the target company's assets by the long-term tax-exempt rate, a figure published by the IRS which usually hovers around 45 or 
This is the amount of lost carry forwards the company can use to offset its net income per year. As you can see, this figure is much smaller than the overall lost carry forwards that companies would prefer to use when they acquire a target company. The basic idea behind Section 382 is that it limits the ability for acquiring companies to use target company losses to offset their own taxable income. Now, this has important consequences for the banking merger and acquisition market. For example, if a healthy bank purchases an unhealthy bank and then sells the purchased bank's assets for below their basis value, the healthy bank is not allowed to use these losses to offset their own taxable income. They can use a portion of them under Section 382, but they're limited. This makes the failing bank less attractive as an acquisition target. Instead of being able to use the full loss carry forwards to offset net income, the acquiring bank would have to multiply the failing bank's assets by the long-term tax exempt rate. As we saw, this reduces the amount that the bank can use to offset its own income. To encourage bank mergers and acquisitions, the Treasury Department issued Notice 2008-100. In this notice, the Treasury Department announced that the Section 382 loss carry forward limitations no longer applied to bank acquisitions. This notice happened to coincide with the timing of the Wells Fargo Wachovia announcement. Now, the effects of this notice were immediate and enormous banks are able to use the write-downs of their targets to immediately offset their positive income and reduce their tax burden by the 35% standard rate. Now, many people questioned whether the Treasury Department had the authority to make this kind of decree. So next, we'll look at what the Treasury Department did in more detail and also look at the legislative response and what tax professionals have to say about the ruling.